Great. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you um, for having us at your conference um, today. Um, it's a real privilege to be here in Zurich and have the opportunity to talk to you in more detail um, about our company, Harbour Energy. Um, my name is Elizabeth Brooks. I'm head of investor relations at, at Harbour. Um, and I think perhaps um, if we turn to the first slide, um, which sets out Harbour's history and how Harbour came about, I think it's probably important, um, speaking to Marcus and Alex earlier, um, they've obviously got long history with Premier Oil. I think it's important to um, say at the outset, Harbour Energy is not Premier Oil. It's a very different company. It has a very different strategy. So Harbour today um, is producing just under 200,000 barrels a day. We have scale in the UK. We're generating strong cash flow. And we have an ambition to diversify and grow through M&A, which we think is a low-risk way of growing, rather than through greenfield exploration and development. We also have a very strong balance sheet, and in fact, we were net debt-free at the end of last period. Um, and at the same time, we will be disciplined while waiting for M&A, and we've made good progress diversifying the portfolio organically um, with op opportunities in Indonesia, Mexico, and also in UK CCS. And also, at the same time, we've been returning um, cash to shareholders through a buyback and a dividend. Um, this slide here sets out how we think about the history of Harbour. Um, so we were founded by mid-sized US private equity firm EIG back in 2014. Blair Thomas, who is our chairman today, um, is CEO of EIG, and Linda Cook, who is CEO of Harbour, uh, was managing partner at EIG. And they both founded Harbour back in 2014 with, which, with what was a contrarian strategy at that time, which was to raise some money to acquire cash generative producing assets outside of North America at a time when the whole world and his wife was focused on US uh, North American shale. Um, the thesis was that they would be able to find um, better value deals, there would be less competition, um, and they'd be able to add value by um, investing in these assets which they were buying off strategic sellers. Um, they looked at numerous opportunities, um, but were patient and disciplined before honing in on the UK North Sea in 2017, um, when they made their first acquisition, buying a package of assets of Shell for $3 billion um, by backing local operating company, Crystal, um, who had significant tax losses at the time. We then followed that up in 2019 with the acquisition of ConocoPhillips UK. And as a result of that acquisition, we became the largest producer in the UK. We then became interested in the combination with Premier Oil. Um, we liked the UK assets. They also had a high quality um, set of international assets and well immaterial in the context of the overall um, Harbour Group. Um, they provided a starting point for diversification beyond the UK. Furthermore, Premier had around $4 billion of UK tax losses, and we were starting to get through the tax losses that came with the Shell acquisition in 2017. However, we struggled with the balance sheet that Marcus um, referred to earlier um, and their equity valuation. Um, COVID then struck, um, Premier's share price um, suffered, and we saw an opportunity um, to implement a merger um, doing through a reverse takeover, which completed in uh, April 2021. And as a result, we became a listed entity, and today we have a market cap of around $2.5 billion. Also on this slide, um, we set out what our strategy is, um, which remains largely unchanged since we founded Harbour in 2014. That is, we aim to continue to build a global, diversified, independent oil and gas company, mainly through M&A, focused on value creation, generating cash flow, and allocating that cash flow wisely. Um, the first leg of our um, strategy, and which is critical to our success, is to be a safe and responsible operator, and safety remains our number one priority at every level of our company. We heard earlier today that we believe there will be a need for oil and gas for some time to come yet, and far better than that oil and gas comes from a responsible, efficient, and safe operator. We have committed um, to be net zero uh, by 2035 and recently set ourselves an interim target of halving our emissions versus the 2018 baseline by 2030. We plan to do that through a number of ways, including 
um, decommissioning responsibly idle and retired infrastructure that cannot be repurposed for CCS. Second, we seek to maximize the value of our portfolio. Um, this includes investing in high return, short cycle, low risk drilling opportunities and continuing to realize synergies from our acquisition, equi um, acquisition integration efforts. Next, and as I've already said, we aim to continue to diversify and grow, mainly via M&A, looking to establish a material production base outside of the UK. At the time of when um, Harbour was formed or became listed in 21, many people doubted that strategy to diversify and grow outside the UK and questioned, why didn't you become a basin master in the UK focusing on that? I think with the imposition of the windfall tax in the UK, no one has since questioned the merit of that strategy. Um, but we do remain um, very selective and focused on value accretion. Um, we're looking to buy conventional cash generating producing assets, which are accretive to our reserve life, our margins, and therefore will also improve our credit quality and support shareholder returns over the longer run. While our strategy remains unchanged, Given what has happened in the commodity price cycle, last year was not the time to buy, um, to buy low. Um, instead, we have continued to involve um, the existing portfolio by progressing um, our promising opportunities in Indonesia and in Mexico, and also our flagship Viking project in the UK. As a result, we have made progress diversifying organically while continuing to explore opportunities for meaningful but disciplined M&A. Um, the environment today, however, we say is much more constructive for M&A and the opportunity set is rich. Um, but as we've demonstrated, if we don't see acquisitions that are right for the company and our investors, then we'll return the cash. And finally, we'll remain true to our commitment to actively manage risk, to protect the balance sheet and to protect our ability to distribute cash to shareholders. Too many times we've seen in our sectors, oil and gas independent companies overstretch themselves um, and get into trouble with having an over-levered balance sheet. Turning to the next slide, um, this just sets out Harbour at a glance. As I mentioned, we're producing a little under 200,000 barrels a day. That's from a reserve and resource base of around 865 million berries. Um, we have a good balance of oil and gas, with our production split broadly evenly between the two. Today, more than 90% of our production comes um, from the UK, where we are the largest producer meeting 15% of the country's domestic oil and gas supply. And while more than 90% of our production does come from the UK and we have high exposure to the UK, we do have good diversification within our UK portfolio with no single asset accounting for more than 15% of our production or cash flow. The remaining 10% of our production comes from Southeast Asia, in Indonesia and Vietnam. And we also have significant um, development opportunities and discoveries in Indonesia and Mexico. We're spending around a billion dollars in total capex a year, 85% of which is in the UK, mainly targeted at high return, quick payback drilling opportunities to help offset the natural decline and support production and cash flow generation. And even with the large amount of money that we're spending, we're still signif generating significant material free cash flow. Um, this year, we expect to generate about a billion dollars um, of free cash flow, which together with our strong balance sheet underpins our $200 million dividend um, policy and provides optionality for further shareholder returns absent M&A. Um, the next slide, um, we turn to this now. We recently presented our half uh, one results. Um, this slide sets out the highlights of the first six months of the year. Um, these include a good operational performance, uh, first with respect to safety, and also particularly in the UK, where production from our operated assets was flat year on year, and where we've taken measures to address our cost structure. Second, progress with our organic projects outside of UK oil and gas, including our flagship CCS project Viking. And third, we did this well, um, improving our balance sheet, resulting in net debt zero at the end of the period. Of course, the UK windfall tax um, continues to have an impact um, on us um, and we remain engaged with the UK government um, to discussing the, what the appropriate fiscal environment would look like um, for the domestic oil and gas sector going forward. 
Um, the domestic oil and gas sector is critical for the UK's energy security and also, um, as Alex alluded to earlier, for the energy transition. It is the oil and gas companies that are leading the UK's efforts to capture and store 30 million tonnes of CO2 by 2030. Um, the next, turning to the next slide, um, where we take a look at production. Um, as you can see, production averaged 196,000 barrels a day for the first half. The reduction versus last year reflects natural decline, offset by contribution from new gas wells at our toll mount field in the North Sea and also J area hubs in the UK. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, as you can see on the right, our operated production, which accounts for around 70% of our, our production, um, was essentially flat year on year. And we also had an increase in gas, gas production, taking us up to that even split of 50% oil, 50% gas today. On the other hand, we are starting to see the impact of other operators' decisions to defer drilling on our production levels in response to the EPL. This is particularly the case at Beryl, where Apache recently paused both their subsea and platform drilling, and that resulted in us narrowing our production guidance down from 185,000 to 200,000 a day to 185 to 190,000 a day. Um, I think, as we heard earlier, if we don't invest, then production goes down. Um, so to put some context around this, UK oil and gas production has declined by 70% since 2000, despite $180 billion of investment. And it is declining much faster than consumption. As a result, the UK is a net importer today of oil and gas, importing around 45% of its oil and gas needs. And without further timely investor investment, then we could be importing as much as 80% of our oil and gas needs in 10 years' time. And that part of that will be coming from LNG, which has a much higher GHG intensity than de domestically produced oil and gas. Um, if, we if we turn to the next slide, um, this is, slide sets out a bit more about our UK performance. Um, production efficiency was generally good for the first half um, at 82% um, um, production efficiency, so just above uh, the UK average of 77%. Um, and in terms of operating costs, they remain flat year on year in the UK, which was a good outturn, especially given the headwinds of inflation. Um, this equated to $15 a bury on a unit of production basis, and again, better than the UK average of $18 a bury. We continue to leverage our scale in the UK to realise efficiencies, especially in the supply chain, and to rationalise our portfolio of supplier contracts. In addition, and in response to the EPL, and to try and preserve margins, we've, taken, um, we've scaled back our activities in certain areas um, and initiated a review of our UK organisation earlier this year. That review is set to complete um, in the coming weeks and has resulted in the 400 uh, losses of visit job, job losses and will result in around cost savings of $50 million from 2024, annual, annual cost savings from 2024. Um, the next slide, um, while the windfall tax in the UK has impacted our activity levels in the UK, um, we are still progressing opportunities which have the potential to maximise the value of our assets and support production and cash flow. Our Armada field is a really good example of this. It came with the Shell portfolio in 2017. At the time, Shell had put in an application to decommission the field in 2018. Um, we pulled that notice and said, no, we're going to invest in the field. We invested in some near-field drilling, um, unblocked a pipeline, and today that field is still producing. And in fact, we recently sanctioned an infill well on Northwest Seymour which, together with further plant modifications, will see field life extended out to 2030. We're also evaluating opportunities to improve recovery factor from our existing operated fields, especially at J area. These would potentially allow us to capture resources and reserves not yet in our book volumes. Um, while feasibility studies are still ongoing, we, are, we have approved investment in 2024 targeting the Judy Chalk which plans to drill a well and retrofit three producing wells for gas lift. If successful, these would add high return incremental reserves and could potentially de-risk additional investment and unlock further reserves in the field. Turning to the next, to the next slide, um, and turning to our organic growth opportunities outside of UK oil and gas. Um, we've made real, real progress here. 
Um, first, we have a growing pipeline of international oil and gas projects. As shown on the left, these could add materially to our reserves and increase our reserve life in the 2024 to 2025 uh, timeframe. In Mexico, the regulator recently approved our field development plan for the Zama field, and we're about to enter uh, feed there, which is the final phase ahead of final investment decision. A final investment decision would expect to see around 75 million berries um, of 2C convert into 2P reserves, replacing over a year's worth of our production and supporting our reserves life. Um, also in Mexico, sorry, oops. Um, back a couple, yeah. Also in Mexico, we had some success with the CAN discovery um, earlier this year. Operated by Vintage Aldea, um, early estimates put oil in place at 200 to 300 million berries, and plans are underway to return there next year with an appraisal well. Moving to Indonesia, we're about to commence upon a high-impact four-well exploration campaign across our Andaman acreage, and we're also hopeful at making <coughs> progress with our tuna project um, which could, would result in the development of 50 million berries, again, adding to our reserve life. Another diversification opportunity for us is CCS, which has the potential to deliver long-term, stable income stream for Harbour, and Graham will talk about this more in a minute. Okay, so now if we turn to the next slide and talk a bit more about the upcoming Andaman um, campaign. Um, we're planning for a minimum four-well programme, which is expected to start in October. This follows the uh, material gas discovery made at Timpan last year, which de-risked this potential multi-TCF gas play. We're partnered with BP and Mabadla. The first well will be on South Andaman, testing the biggest prospect, the Lyran prospect, before the rig moves to drill Hawa and Gaio. And then it will return to drill a further well on Andaman South. Um, the location will be determined once we've got the Lyran, um, the result in. Um, of all the places to be drilling for gas, doing exploration gas, this is in the right zip code. The demand for gas in Southeast Asia is huge, and there's numerous routes to market in Singapore, in Malaysia, in Thailand, and Indonesia. Um, so that's probably an area to watch in the coming months. If we turn to the next slide now, um, before turning to hedging, it's probably worth summarizing the key financial highlights of our first half. As mentioned, we generated material free cash flow. This enabled us to reduce our net debt to zero and supported competitive shareholder distributions over the period. Second, we forecast a billion dollars of free cash flow for this year, and this reflects the, the heavy first half weighting of our free cash flow due to the phasing of capex and tax payments, as well as some positive working capital movements. Third, this is all underpinned by a prudent approach to risk management and strict capital discipline in line with our three capital allocation priorities um, of protect, ensuring a robust balance sheet, investing in our portfolio to ensure a robust and resilient portfolio, and delivering meaningful shareholder returns, including via our $200 million annual dividend. Um, on this slide, it sets out our, our hedging policy. So for 2023, we're about 50% hedge. 65% on the gas side and 30% on the oil side, um, evenly spread over the first six months of the year and the second. This is as a result of historical hedging put in place to protect the balance sheet when we levered up in order to execute the Premier deal. We got some criticism last year when gas prices spiked, oil prices were up, and our hedgings, we were sitting on a big mark-to-market -market loss. But for us, the, protect, the importance of protecting the balance sheet um, is, is critical, and what we've been able to do since is still continue to, to delever. Um, but now that our balance sheet has delevered, we're sitting on a net cash position, um, we think we can give more, we can reduce our hedging and take more commodity price exposure. So as you can see, the first four bars on this chart relate to 2023 hedging, and you can then see that it falls down dramatically in 2024 um, and beyond, which is what you would expect given where our hedging uh, given where our balance sheet is. Um, it is probably also worth um, noting that in our last determination, I think I just clicked something. Sorry. Ah, oh, there we go. Um, in our last redetermination, we negotiated with our uh, banks a relaxing of the hedging requirements, such that it is now linked to how much we are drawn on the RBL. So while we're less than 10% drawn on our main debt facility, we have no hedging um, requirements 
um, placed on us. Um, if we turn to the next slide on the balance sheet, um, you can see here that we have reduced our net debt by $2.9 billion since April 2021, the time of the premier merger, continuing our track record of rapidly paying down debt post large-scale acquisition. We have also built a track record of returning capital to shareholders and have announced a billion dollars of shareholder returns since December 2021. This reflects our $200 million annual dividend uh, policy and also um, the return of excess capital via buybacks. In March 2023, most recently, we announced a $200 million buyback, which is ongoing today. And we continue to review and discuss the potential for additional shareholder returns at every single board meeting, taking into account a number of factors, including the macro environment outlook, um, other capital allocation priorities, and the pipeline of M&A opportunities. Um, at $80 a barrel and 100p a therm, as I mentioned, we expect to generate around a billion dollars of free cash flow this year. Um, and as a result, given the first half weighting of our cash flow, we do expect to finish the year in a small net debt position of around $200 million, um, but continue to see the potential to be net debt free in 2024. Turning to the next slide, this sets out our guidance for 2023. Um, so production guidance here has been narrowed as a result of barrel um, Apache deferring uh, drilling activities at Beryl, so we now expect production for the year to be between 185 to 195,000 barrels a day. Operating cost guidance is maintained at $16 a bury, which is evidence of our strong cost control, especially given the strengthening uh, British pound that we see with over 90% of our costs denominated in sterling. And total capex is reduced from 1.1 billion to 1 billion, as we have seen um, operators defer drilling programs and also some of our capex now falling into 2024. So in summary and turning to the, my final slide before handing over to um, Graham, um, good strong operational performance in, in the first half um, with a ma active management of our cost base. Um, this resulted in strong cash flow enabling us to reduce net debt to zero and, um, and this strong financial cash flow and position has supported competitive shareholder returns and puts us in a good position going forward. It remains our intention to grow and diversify internationally, establishing a material base of production outside of the UK through M&A. And we're seeing more opportunities today than we have done so in the past, helped by the less volatile environment. However, we continue to be disciplined and very focused on value creation and will only tra transact if, if we can see a so strong strategic fit with our business. In the meantime, we've significantly progressed our non-UK oil and gas investment opportunities, which have the potential to materially increase our reserve life, support shareholder returns, and diversify our company over time, and have continued to return excess capital to shareholders.